So I just want to say welcome. I see a lot of familiar faces, a lot of familiar names. Um, we just want to say thank you again for everyone who's being here. Um, we are into our third session of Civic Dialogues this semester, and um, we are looking forward to having more next semester. So this is going to be an ongoing kind of event. And so um, before we get started, I want to make just some, some introductions, tell you a little bit about how this works, because there, there I think are a couple folks here, I'm not recognizing names, so this may be new for you today. Um, and then we're going to introduce our, um, our speaker. Um, so my name is Patty Robinson. I am the Faculty Director of Civic and Community Engagement at College of the Canyons. Um, we are a, a community college located in North Los Angeles County, and I'm here with my, my two colleagues and friends, uh, Jan Connell from 3CSN and Kimberly Rosenfeld from Cerritos College. And so um, we are here working on a project. Uh, part of this stems from a, a Bringing Theory to Practice grant that we started um, a couple of years <laughs> ago. Uh, creating a civic engagement pathway between the California Community College system and the CSU system. And um, I also have a couple of our, our other colleagues that are here as well working on our current grant. So I see Tony uh, Clark and I know Mitra Hoshiar just uh, uh, came on board as well today. Um, so with today, um, we are going to have um, Dr. Harry Boyd talk about his work and his um, extensive background in, um, in public work uh, and also in civic engagement and all kinds of other things dealing with community organizing. But before I read his formal bi biography, I wanna just give you an idea of how it's set up today with our presentation. So the first hour will be the conversation with Dr. Boyd. Um, you will have an opportunity to place questions in the chat or certainly towards the end of the hour, um, we will also open it up if you would like to ask Dr. Boyd uh, a question in person. Um, so certainly you can do that as well. The second hour will be followed by a deep dive. And this is where Kimberly, Jan and I um, typically will take material from that first hour and actually work with uh, the folks who stay um, for that second hour and do a deeper kind of examination discussion of that material. Um, and I know that today Dr. Boyd is going to, to stay uh, with us during that second hour. So this is a great opportunity for those of you to actually um, participate in that second hour and have that, that conversation with Dr. Boyd uh, in, a, in a very uh, intimate kind of, of way in this presentation. So with that, uh, it's my honor to um, introduce, excuse me, Dr. Harry Boyd. Um, Dr. Boyd is a public intellectual organizer and theorist uh, of public work of the public work framework of civic engagement. He is a senior scholar in public work philosophy at Augsburg University and a co-founder of the New Institute for Public Life and Work. In the 1960s, he was a field secretary for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference headed by Martin, uh, Martin Luther King and subsequently did community organizing with poor whites in Durham, North Carolina from 1966 to 72. In 1990, Dr. Boyd founded Public Achievement, the youth po uh, political and civic in education initiative, which spread to more than 20 countries. Public Achievement draws on his experiences in the citizenship schools of uh, more than 20, uh, excuse me, of the American Civil Rights Movement. In 1994, he founded the Center for Democracy and Citizenship at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. And from 93 to 95, Dr. Boyd coordinated reinventing citizenship across partisan alliance uh, of educational, civic, and philanthropic um, uh, civic groups, which worked with the White House Domestic Policy Council and the Clinton administration to analyze the gap between citizens and government and to propose solutions. Dr. Boyd uh, presented findings to uh, Camp David Summit on the future of democracy in 1995 with President Clinton and other senior members of his administration. Uh, in 2012 to 13, he coordinated the American Commonwealth Partnership, a, com a confederation of higher education and civic groups formed to uh, commemorate the 150th anniversary of the Morrell Act establishing, establishing land-grant colleges. 
Um, also, just to, uh, extensive background in publications, um, uh, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but Dr. Boyd uh, definitely wanted you to be aware of a couple that um, uh, I think that really reflect today's presentation, uh, Awakening Democracy, um, and then also Free Spaces. And just in not only a long extensive list of, of uh, books that uh, Dr. Boyd has uh, published, but he has 150 other publications that he's either co-authored or written uh, on his own um, that have appeared in all kinds of publications from the New York Times to the Wall Street Journal uh, to the Chronicle of Higher Education. So with that is my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Harry Boyd. Thank you. Thank you, Patty, very much. Um, this is a really a pleasure to be here. I should note uh, that there is good news on the community college front. Um, the American Rescue Plan has $2.2 billion for community colleges in California, if you haven't heard that news. Um, I think it's a kind of sign too of other developments. For example, a very important alliance around a service called the Service Year Alliance, which is a merger of three groups, it has a, a billion dollars in the, in the same rescue bill to expand AmeriCorps. Uh, and then it's, it's worth noting that uh, President, um, along with others in cross-partisan ways, uh, Sherrod Brown, the Senator from Ohio, and Tim Scott, the Republican Senator from South Carolina, all, all emphasize the dignity of work. So you put those together and what I think um, this means is that community colleges are well positioned to take leadership in a civic renaissance or civic revitalization. Then I'll go into why, but it, it means that this whole dialogue series is extraordinarily important and timely. Okay, next slide. So in the movement, um, no, this, yeah. Um, in the movement, uh, I worked for the Martin Luther King's organization. And as some of you know, the movement drew on founding values and documents like the Declaration of Independence and the letter from a Birmingham and, and the Constitution. King, in this letter from a Birmingham jail, talks about the whole movement bringing back an understanding, which gets to another dimension today. In recent years, the meaning of democracy and citizenship and politics have all shrunk. In the movement, I learned that democracy is really about work we do in every setting. Um, the founding documents for the movement, of course, were inspirations, they weren't blueprints. And the movement was challenging the narrow ways that uh, we, the people, had been defined. Next slide. Uh, the preamble to the Constitution is a very bold statement and, and very unusual in world history to say that we, the people, created government. It wasn't handed down from the antiquity or the creation of monarchs. Actually, we, the people, create government in order to be an instrument of our work. That puts the people at the middle of democracy, um, which is really a, a distinctive way of thinking. And of course, it was a narrow understanding of we, the people, in the founding moments. So in some ways, as Vincent Harding, a great friend and former speechwriter of King, uh, often put it, the movement was an outcropping of the continuing struggle to expand democracy. And that meant was deepening democracy to mean much more than simply voting, and also to explain who we the people include to an inclusive understanding. Um, the goal of the movement, according to Septima Clark, uh, who was the founder of the Citizenship School movement I'll talk about, I was, uh, the citizenship schools were hundreds of local grassroots leadership citizenship schools across the South that Andy Young, the former ambassador, said that were the foundation of the whole movement. She described the point of the citizen of the movement itself as actually broadening the understanding of democracy. Next slide. Uh, here's Septima Clark, who was the founder in a, one of the early citizenship schools on John's Island off the South Carolina coast. So my boss in the movement was Dorothy Cotton, a director of the citizenship education program when the Southern Christian Leadership Conference took it over from Highlander Folk School. This was a very important statement from her book. 
um, I fear Beck's not bent about the citizenship schools in her own life. We wanted to make the basic documents on which our country, yes, our country, is founded come alive. We intended to establish and deepen the concept and awareness of ourselves as victims, as citizens, no more being victims. And government is not outsiders, so we're not consumers of government, but government is us. Next slide. Okay, this is a striking video. Uh, we're going to use to see the first five minutes of, of, the, of Dorothy Cotton and the citizenship schools. You might be interested in the earliest flicker of consciousness about the great wrong that I realized was being perpetrated against black people. I was about 10 years old and a boy about my age was riding his bicycle down our dusty little street there in Goldsboro, North Carolina, the town where I was born. Uh, you could tell where black folk lived because the pavement stopped when it got through the white neighborhood and the black folk lived where the streets were, were dusty. As this boy was riding his bicycle and picking up the dust down our street, he was singing a tune, what is it, deep in the heart of, is it Texas? He was singing, deep in the heart of town. I've never forgotten that how upset I felt, how angry I felt, how helpless to do anything about it. I've never forgotten that little boy. I knew one thing about Dorothy. When the children came home, when all four of them came home, she would sit them in chairs in this little uh, house and she would be the teacher. And every day that they would do this, she would get up and teach them something. You know, she was a teacher. There was a teacher who took a very special interest in me. One day I said a poem in her class. I don't remember what the poem was, but I do remember that and as I headed back to my seat, she said very audibly, there's your ready girl. It rings in my ear to this day when Miss Rosa Gray said to the class, there's your ready girl. That phrase, that description just goes around and around in my consciousness. Uh, there's your ready girl. But I knew that, uh, I think I'm gonna cry. I knew that I never wanted to disappoint her. There would have been no President Barack Obama without the citizenship schools of Dorothy. Now, let's be clear. Every black member of the United States Congress owes their part of their being there to the studying and the teaching of those citizenship schools that laid the foundation for black political power and fusion political power between black folk and white folk and brown folk that have worked to change this country to where it is today. And while we may not be where we ought to be, we would not be where we are if it was not for the sacrifice of those like Dorothy Cox. The citizenship education program was about helping people discover their power. We had to help people understand what made a citizen. What was citizenship all about? What did it mean? Every aspect of our system, the political system, every institution helped to reinforce the notion that black folk were less than other people in the culture. One had to know cursive writing in order to register. I think it was just a trick to actually to exclude black folk. But we knew that we could do more with this training program than just help people learn to read and write. You don't know what you don't know until someone teaches you, until you, you learn, until you get invited into another chapter of the story, so to speak. 
I didn't know about citizenship education or the citizenship education project. It wasn't until later that I really understood the fact that people traveled from all over the region, all over the South and the border states to really become equipped for the movement and for the struggle. Fannie Lou Hamer lived on Mr. Marlowe's plantation in uh, Ruleville, Mississippi, and she was trying to get black folk to understand why they ought to register to vote. She was threatened that she would be killed, her family would be killed, if she didn't stop that foolishness of telling black folk that they ought to have some political power. I mentioned her because she was one of our star pupils who... So that uh, Dorothy, in this video, which we didn't have time to show the whole of, uh, ends by saying the heart of the citizenship schools was developing a sense of agency, that people could change their circumstances, that everyone had the capacity and the potential to be agents of their own lives and of the larger society. Um, so we've developed that in our work over the years to think about um, what is citizenship. And it's not a single thing, there are different frameworks and same way with, with democracy. Um, could we go back to the slide before for a second? Um, so in conventional terms, democracy means elections and civic education is civics. And that's an important part of it, not to uh, diminish it, but it's not, it's a narrow understanding. Uh, so the second understanding of citizenship, which has become very widespread in higher education and K-12 is service or volunteerism uh, and also service learning in courses. Um, and the, but the third, understanding of citizenship really goes back to we the people created the society and the democracy that service as public work and what is developed in service as public work is different than the individual responsibility or the knowledge in civics we would call it civic agency the capacity for informed ethical and effective public or cooperative action the next slide um, so public achievement which i founded in 1990, uh, with the help of Dorothy Cotton, I should say, and also the mayor of St. Paul, Jim Scheibel, um, sought to bring the lessons of the citizenship education program uh, to young people today in our time. And the heart of it is empowerment. Um, here at the University of Colorado Boulder, which has a very strong public achievement um, initiative, um, it, it describes public achievements purpose is placing young people at the center of the civic environment. Next slide. And it talks here about the fact that the University of Colorado Boulder public achievement has spread across the school district in the community, the Boulder Valley School District. Excuse me, uh, go on, thanks. So this is an overview of what public achievement means for uh, young people um, and these are voices of, of those called coaches in public achievement, which work with teams of young people who choose their issue. Um, and then um, they're coached by college students, but they coach this don't dominate or dictate or be a tip traditional teacher in the citizenship schools as in public achievement. Uh, teachers are more coaches who bring out people's talents and capacities. Okay, can we play I would that? describe PA in three words as youth leading social change, empowerment and transformational change. Uh, I love this program because it's not a program you're going to see every day. You don't get the, you don't ever get this opportunity to go out work with middle schoolers, high schoolers and really make an impact in the community. Hi, I'm Sharla Lello Agnoletti, and I'm the Program Director for Public Achievement at C Boulder. Public achievement uh, is a model for youth civic engagement so that young people can engage in everyday democracy and social change through their schools. And it's a program where we have collaboration between our undergraduate students at the university and then also middle school and high school students in Boulder and Lafayette, Colorado through our program. My favorite thing, I would say uh, probably working with the students, but 
um, mostly seeing the students grow. So in the beginning of the year, sometimes they're like, well, I don't know why I chose the topic of immigration, but I did. And so throughout the year, they'll understand that and they'll see their beliefs and kind of like their own story of self and their background as to why they're passionate about what they're passionate about and finding themselves and really just um, finding their why in life, seeing what they want to do, how this relates to their career, what they want to do in school, um, and mostly like seeing them grow as leaders um, is a really big thing. So I think the most rewarding aspect of PA is when young people in the program, whether it's middle school students or the high school students or even our college students, really own our program. And they come to me and say, this is what we need to be doing. Here's the changes we need to be making. Um, here's what we want to do next. And so I think when our students know that they have authentic, true power within the work that we do and within our organization, that's the most rewarding for me because that's the point of the work that we do. The most rewarding aspect is, and I think it still is, um, just like that implicit power and autonomy that you are reaching and cultivating for your voice and then your students' voices as well. Um, I think that it's completely relevant to the time that we're in right now and helping people feel as though they aren't powerless and that they have you know, the ability to kind of address and talk about and take action and create conversation around issues that are impacting us every single day rather than feeling hopeless. Um, so I think that is the, yeah, overarching like power and like reason behind it for me. This program has given me the ability to work with some great students and see them growing up through these four years in this project has really been inspiring and the work that I do, I don't take for granted. This is a really awesome program and one of the reasons that I've been in it for so long is that it ties me to the community at CU better than just having friends and being in classes. It's a way that makes you feel connected to not only the other undergrad students that um, you are in classes with, but also a group of students who um, are part of the uh, Boulder Valley School District community outside of CU. Part of the process that we go through is actually helping everyone who participates in our program articulate a story about why they're doing the work that they're doing and one of the three components of it is a story of now and we talk about that in a way of okay so I'm here I'm physically present in this space I'm physically present in this work in this program I'm in community with the people this story of us this collective moment and then what now like why does it matter now that we're gathered in this class in 2019 in Colorado in Boulder in Lafayette um, and I think that it's even more evident today because we're constantly interacting with things that are happening in the United States, in the world, like it's more accessible to everybody all the time right now. Um, and I think it gives people a way to move from feeling inhibited, feeling powerless, feeling hopeless to feeling as though you can actually critically look at something and take action on it and not just feel the weight of the world and everything happening. I graduated from CU and came back to something that like really identified with my values and that's why I chose to keep working with the program. But the beauty is that there is inherent, you know, like community in the class itself, in the program itself, and that's why we have people who stay. Um, and there's a lot of things in place to also allow for people to stay and continue to grow with our program um, that make you want to stay beyond just, you know, doing the good work and the important work that we do. I think that one of the biggest benefits of participation in PA is that we learn how to navigate power and we learn learn how to navigate systems and communities by building authentic relationships, by understanding how power works and how people are influenced, and that helps us essentially learn to create more power, influence power, um, and the benefit in that is then you have people who know how to work in teams to actually think about creative ways to address some of our society's most challenging problems. Thank you. Uh, next slide. So public achievement has several features. Young people develop uh, the capacity to navigate their environments and make change. And, and people have done remarkable things in uh, communities across the US and in other countries too, from working on bullying to building playgrounds, to working on racial prejudice, to uh, working on um, school curriculum change. But a couple of features are important to highlight. 
Uh, one is that it is not traditional service. So Jay Tice, who at the Lone Star Community College, who's been a leader in public achievement for more than 20 years, says he has to work with coaches to make it clear this is not service. This is not helping poor, disadvantaged, helpless young people. This is about bringing out the talent and the energy and the creativity of, and intelligence of young people. So it's a shift from a deficit point of view to an asset point of view. Another really key aspect is that we call every team a free space. A free space is places where um, young people of very different backgrounds and different interests and different views get to interact and do something that uh, they want to do. So uh, the coaches are those who help students develop their own capacities. They're different than safe spaces and they're also where, which protects students from discomfort, or are they different than bold spaces where students call each other out? And of course, this happens also in professions too, for views that are seen as wrong. Next slide. So Dennis Donovan is our master coach. He's made his school of St. Bernard's into the uh, kind of the lodestone, the incubator of public achievement in the 1990s, became a famous in the US and around the world for the things that the students did and the ways they could take leadership. This was an elementary school. He teaches a class on public achievement in the University of Minnesota. He also does consultation with people all over about public achievement. Um, so I asked a couple of his students, what makes Dennis's class a free space? If they agree, it is a free space. And they, uh, these are just two of the many responses. Uh, one, Nick Gable, who's in his class now, says the atmosphere allows for students to discuss and learn their interpretation of civic life from the lens of their own experience. It's not delivered to students. Next slide. Um, well, the next slide I didn't, I haven't, I hadn't put into this, this version, but let me read you another uh, slide from a student who became a, a, a really great student organizer. This is Ali Oosterhoos who was in, a, in, her class, in his class several years ago. Dennis's class was a free space because there was no one right thing to say. Everyone's lived experience was validated. That's why every participant said what they truly felt and believed without fear of judgment. And that's why the class is so popular and it's also so diverse from um, progressive students to conservative students, business students, feminist students, basketball players, football players. Um, it's a free space. So we've also worked to create free spaces, we and our colleagues in different settings. Next slide. Uh, one of them is uh, the, the depolarization group, which some of you may have heard of because it's getting a lot of news. This is a group to overcome the red blue divide, the polarization on campuses and in communities across the country. It began after this night, the 2016 election when the David Blankenhorn, who was the president of the Institute of American Values and his colleague, David Lapp, organized a meeting between Trump supporters and Clinton supporters in rural Ohio. Blankenhorn had been really worried about the deepening polarization. But he, they, they drew in Bill Doherty, who they'd worked with in the past, um, who had been uh, a family therapist for many years um, and he drew on his family therapy experience. He's also a professor at the U and the director of the Citizen Professional Center. Uh, he developed a process that allowed participants to bring their best selves forward, to listen to the other person and not just immediately get into an argument and to reflect on their own contribution to the problem. Next slide. Um, he also brought the public work and free space ideas he'd been working with. So it wasn't simply a private encounter. He divided people up in red and blue, uh, Republican and Democrat, and they thought about how their group was seen by the other side, the stereotypes. And then also, this was a note of humility, is there any grain of truth in the stereotypes? And finally, what they'd see themselves as having to contribute to the community and the society. Um, and they were all amazed. They said, um, we unanimously came to understand our experiences of talking with rather than at cause us to abandon our belief that the other side was impossible. And Brave Rangers has been growing rapidly 
And a number of community colleges were involved in this election in an initiative that I was involved with called With Malice Toward None. And that's gonna continue. It's about how to depolarize campuses, but also how to build democratic cultures. Next slide. This is a video from CBS News on uh, Braver Angels, and we'll just uh, do the first part of it. I pledge to be a president who seeks not to divide, but unify. Who doesn't see red states and blue states, only sees the United States. Welcome back to CBS This Morning. If Joe Biden is committed to that pledge, he has a lot of work ahead of him. Americans are fiercely split not only about policy, but on the basic decency of the other side. In a recent Pew poll, for example, only about one in five registered voters said that they share core American values with the other party. And about nine in ten people, basically everybody, worried that a victory by the opposition would do lasting harm to America. So one idea to ease this strain is to give America what you would any other struggling relationship, a little therapy. How are you feeling about the state of the country? I'm devastated. You are? I am. I think our country is more divided than ever. Oh, it's terrible. It's terrible. After 244 years together as a nation, we seem to be growing apart. Are you concerned about the polarization and division in the country? Absolutely. Yeah, of course. I feel like there's not a lot of compassion for us as human beings for each other anymore. And just about everyone seems to agree that the state of our union is on the rocks. Yes, yes, def definitely, yes. Definitely like the feeling where the husband comes home and goes, goes, does his hobbies and doesn't talk to the wife until they go to bed. There is a professor at the University of Minnesota who does marriage counseling uh, and who thinks that America is a bit like a marriage and the marriage is not going too well. Ooh, we need therapy. We do. Yeah. He does therapy as it happens. <laughs> he is Bill Doherty, a family therapist and co-founder of a nonprofit called Braver Angels, which runs thousands of workshops nationwide. It, once polarization takes root, it, it's an escalation. Dedicated to repairing the bond between liberals and conservatives, using the very same techniques that Doherty has used to help husbands and wives. We are an American family. We sit at the same table can imagine one big Thanksgiving table. And if we expel people from the table because of their political views, we will lose our ability to function as a country. Doherty says Americans first need to decide that our democracy is worth saving. And not everybody thinks so. As one man told us, we need to have a divorce. A big threat that I see growing right now is the people who are saying that they are morally compromised by having a conversation with somebody who differs from them. Morally compromised because they are condoning evil. This is a serious threat to a democracy. Doherty says that addressing it requires getting each side to take responsibility for their role in the quarrel. But as we discovered over two days of talking to voters across the political spectrum, talking about the other side is a hard habit to break. That was certainly true for Biden supporters. Our current president denies science. He um, is in denial about a deadly pandemic. The, the marriage counselor professor would tell me to tell you, Forget about the other side. Forget about what yeah. they're doing. Talk about the Democrats. How can they help heal this divide? They need to start meeting halfway. I just think they're so self-involved with their, their own. Pardon me for interrupting, but the marriage counselor professor would tell me to tell you, forget about what the Republicans are okay. doing. Okay. Yeah. I just find the hypocrisy of what the Republicans are spewing. Okay, marriage counseling. I'm supposed to, yeah. Okay. Sorry. All right. All right. But Trump supporters also struggled with what Doherty calls the humility question. Is it hard to think about the ways you and your party might be contributing? Sure. Both sides are. Um, I, I just, I think the other side is just a little too crazy for me. Channeling the marriage counselor here, he would tell me to tell you, forget about the other side. What about you guys? What can you do differently? Mm -hmm. I, it's a tough one. Still, just about everyone we spoke to was, with a little push, willing to admit that their side is not perfect. Both liberals... You think Democrats share some of the blame for the nastiness in politics today? Oh, yes. I'm, I wish I could 
say, oh, no, they have nothing to do with it, but they do. A hundred percent. They do. A hundred percent. And conservatives. Well, I think the blame probably, if you had to be honest, would fall with the president. His criticism and his rhetoric divided the country. Well, I'm, I'm a little concerned about the uh, president's re refusal to concede. Embracing conspiracy theories never helps. Many were also willing to acknowledge that our American marriage requires a little give and take. I think that we should have health care for all, and I um, won't, wouldn't take a compromise for that. Let's take that idea. Okay. Let's imagine the marriage of Americans, Democrats and Republicans. You're on one side and you're saying health care for all. The other side's saying no way. How do you stay married? It's a good, a good, a good point you bring up. Good question, I have to say, because I, I wish I put some more thought into this. Both parties talk about bringing people together, but none of the policies or conversations really support that. So I think if you're not helping the situation, then you are hurting it. That's very therapy-ish, yeah. So, right. like, I'm I passing. It's insight like this that makes Bill Doherty, if not exactly confident, at least hopeful that America is on the mend. I think people are starting to realize we can't go on this way. I have hope that we're gonna wake up and see divisiveness and polarization as our enemy, not people on the other political side. Oh, I like that. All right, I, I feel yes. like the way I did it. Oh, like okay. Thank you. Next slide. So a lot of our work has been asking the question, how do we develop an understanding of citizenship and service as public work uh, and creating free spaces and spread them in colleges to revive the once robust understanding of higher education is significantly about democracy. And I should say community colleges were at the heart of that. The Truman Commission on Higher Education was one of the launching pads for the expansion of community colleges. And community colleges, as some of you know, were called democracy colleges. Next slide. So one of the ways that was expressed was that uh, colleges were uh, part of communities, not partners with communities. And that took concrete form. For example, a very important uh, program, federal program, called Cooperative Ex Education from 1965 to 1996, uh, brought local employers in business, in nonprofits, in public service, in health, together with education, together with colleges. Um, it was pioneered by a guy named Herbert, uh, Herman Snyder, who was building on John Dewey's argument that education needs to connect students with real things and materials. And also Dewey's warning that the tendency of every vocation and profession is to emphasize a technical at the expense of a larger meaning. So next slide. So what, is this, what does this look like in practice? At Augsburg University, which had a very strong cooperative education effort, Lois Olson, who'd come from a rural community was the director. And she saw her work as creating what she called the local pool hall in a small town where conversations were about citizenship and politics and religion and economic life, and they were all intertwined. What Lois did at, the, at Augsburg was to create an employer council, and a council of employers in the Twin Cities, especially Minneapolis, and a faculty council from Augsburg. And together they developed plans for incorporating academic learning into the work that employers expected of students and uh, many kinds of work experiences including on-campus experiences. So they pose questions to students to help them think about their careers, not only in narrow terms, but also in civic terms and create free spaces in the workplace. So she would uh, tell the students who went out in any kind of work situation to look at and describe and investigate the culture and the mission and the purpose of the employer and talk to people about it. And sometimes uh, they were disappointed, sometimes they were excited. Many times they organized discussions with their fellow workers and with uh, the organization. Next slide. Well, this has been significantly diminished. The program was, was abolished in 1996. It was a great loss. Um, and ironically, it was uh, Bill Clinton, the president, thought it was important to expand more citizenship work through national service. So he cut out the a cooperative education, which means he didn't think of that as citizenship. But it is coming back. And 
Uh, Bill Flores, a uh, professor of political science and the uh, director of the University of Houston Downtown Graduate Program in Nonprofit Management is a real leader here. So he's created a program through sustained working relationships between the well, one program for the uh, for uh, MBA and one for nonprofit management, which brings uh, together faculty and local employers and leaders in various sectors and advisory councils uh, work closely. Next slide. So uh, Bill knows the concept of free spaces. He used it actually in working with farm workers many years ago in, in uh, California. Um, so he's created uh, opportunities for students to have a kind of free space experience. So one example he gave in an email was in his nonprofit management class, students develop a, a, a project plan working with a nonprofit and using what's called a strength-based or an asset-based approach, looking at community strengths. Um, and uh, the team works with community members of all kinds, not only the CEOs, but the staff and individuals involved. And, and the point is to have many different kinds of students and backgrounds work on a project in a practical way um, that uh, really creates something of public value, some civic purpose. And so we would say it's a free space that does public work. I think these elements of public work, of reconnection as parts of the life of communities, of rethinking vocational education to be much more interactive and reciprocal between employers and, and uh, colleges, um, of developing ways for students to develop their own agency and capacity. That is the future direction of the civic engagement movement in higher education and also has tremendous implications for America as we develop new citizen professionals who go into the world. Um, it's all conveyed in a way by that song from the movement. Let's switch to that. Uh, this is a song that Dorothy Cotton sang to public achievement for the years we had her involved in getting started. Um, we are the ones, we are the ones we've been waiting. We are the we ones, are the ones, we are the ones, we've been waiting. We are the ones, we are the ones, we've been waiting. We are the ones, we are the ones, we've been waiting. We are the ones, we are the ones, we've been waiting. We are the ones. Okay, thanks, Ken. Uh, the point of Dorothy Cotton's song um, is the idea that uh, a we the people centered democracy with an inclusive understanding of we the people means that we all take responsibility for being the agents and builders of the democracy. It's not something that we can slough off to people we elect for, uh, to do things for us or to experts in programs that simply provide services. We have to really take ownership of the democracy. This is a short list of uh, uh, bibliography. We'll have this soon on our, we're creating a new website of the Institute for Public Work, Public Life and Work, and it'll have a lot of resources, including these and others, and, and some videos like the ones you've seen. Okay, uh, floor is open for discussion, debate, argument, questions, whatever. And we can talk more in the smaller groups after the, after the hour or two. So we'd like to open it up for questions. Um, feel free to either uh, place a question uh, in the chat or unmute yourself. Uh, and so Kimberly, Jan and I are, are here. We're looking at the, uh, the chats, but we're also, again, encouraging anyone to just unmute themselves if you'd like to ask Dr. Boyd a question directly. It's good to see a lot of people I know, by the way. Nancy Franish and Elsie Gerber and um, Leslie Garvin from North Carolina and many others. So Dr. Boyd, Boyd, I have a question that maybe we can start off with as people are, are um, getting ready to put something into the chat. Um, I find what you, you just said at the very end very, very interesting about sort of uh, the role of civic engagement, the movement, and how you see it 
going in a direction where there will be, it sounds to me, if I'm understanding it correctly, really this connection much more with our communities in a sense where um, even the idea where we could take students into the community and educate them. And, I, and I'm, I'm guessing that part of what you're, you're also saying that bringing those to the experts and, and having this idea of, of being co-educators. Um, I think that's something that we, we don't do enough of. And it sounds like you're suggesting that if we're really gonna get back to this idea of getting students to understand their roles as citizens, that that becomes a very integral part of it. And, and again, that, that connection with the workplace. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we think workplaces uh, today as they we kind of regrow their own civic roots. You know, as higher education has lost its connection to communities, that's true for other institutions, K-12, uh, businesses, uh, health clinics, many institutions and government agencies. So we think that actually uh, higher education can take leadership in reintegrating America's uh, civic institutions commercial and government institutions into the life of communities. That's really a frontier. And, and a key to doing that is what we call citizen professional, someone who thinks of himself as a citizen, not simply a specialist, and uh, who, where possible, can create what we call free spaces. So Bill Doherty is a good example of someone who's on a large scale multiplied free spaces. And that was what I saw in the civil rights movement. All the teachers of the citizenship schools across the South, and they were free spaces. That's where I got the idea. Um, they were open. They were diverse. It wasn't a lecture format. It was people drawing on their own experiences and learning. There was coaching, and there was there were teachers, but they were co-teachers, co-creators. Um, every single one of the people in the hundreds of citizenship schools were what I would call citizen professionals. And I think that was evident by that one quote you had from the young man who, again, emphasized the the real the lived experience. That again, it wasn't it wasn't that the, the teaching was just book knowledge, but really being able to capture um, the assets of one's own background and personal experience, which I think is so important. And it seems to me today that that is really what we need to start doing because students thrive on this. They want to be a part of telling their stories. And, and I think when we have education that can kind of do that shift, um, that's how you're going to get the hook. That's how this, these students are going to really become, in my mind, um, you know, active participants in, in our democracy. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you, Patty. And, I, and we've seen, I should say that we've seen in our work and our networks, um, people create uh, citizen teachers, uh, create these kind of free spaces that draw on students lived experience and their experience of life and views um, in many different fields, not simply political science or public affairs, but actually in chemistry and nursing. Nursing is really a hotbed um, in education, in schools of education, in engineering. And we have colleagues redesigning the curriculum of Olin engineering around a citizen professional idea. So it's possible to, to, uh, to in health of all kinds, it's possible to do this in many different fields. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Dr. Ford? Um, yes, good to I see just, you. You know, I, I just wanted to say that I surely appreciate your presentation. And, and, and even more than that, though, hey, I uh, tip my hat to you for your participation, you know, in the civil rights uh, struggle. Uh, believe it or not, you know, uh, I haven't met too many uh, white friends or uh, acquaintances that were actually, uh, that actually played such a, an important role in that struggle, in that revolution. And, and of course, we all know uh, that uh, without our white allies, uh, that who knows how long it would be, if ever, if we would have gained the rights that, that we finally did during the, with the civil rights legislation in 1964. But anyway, so my question in a nutshell is, uh, your participation in that struggle, uh, did you already have this commitment prior to then uh, for a struggle for equality or, or did that uh, experience uh, really re invigorate, invigorate, re, uh, uh, did that even add it to the level of commitment that you had? In other words, did that play a role in your lifelong commitment? Well, yeah, it shaped my life. The movement shaped my life. But I should say, I didn't think of it myself. 
like most everything, you know, you in a you know set of relationships. In it, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. My family were uh, uh, just a handful of outspoken uh, whites who were critics of segregation. My dad was a manager of the Atlanta Red Cross. Uh, he desegregated the Red Cross, and then he got involved in helping to start a group that was for keeping public schools open when the political establishment was talking about closing them. And that was a pivot point in our life because we had, his name was in the paper. We had 150 phone calls when I was 12 years old in 1958, threatening us. So, and then he went on. Uh, and the reason I worked for SELC was dad became uh, the only elderly white guy on the executive committee of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So I heard all secondhand, I was a kid, but I heard secondhand all these great discussions about the March on Washington and so forth. And then I worked on the citizenship education program. And that was, that I would say is really the formative experience of my life. Thank you. Else, we have a chance here to ask some great questions. I wonder if Nancy uh, Kranish has some parallel experiences in her work. She's been a real leader in the civic kind of renewal of the library world and the civic mission of local libraries, which are a good example of citizen professionals. Hi, Harry. Hey, Nancy. It's um, great to see you. So I, 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 I love the way you talk about this and it's just so inspiring it's hard for me to think about my own work but I think so I teach in a library school and work in the library world but work well beyond the library world with people like Harry who's so allowed me to learn and participate well beyond but I think for all of us the issue is how do we become good listeners and deep listeners of what our communities are really about? And I think that's a real challenge for us right now. Um, I'm teaching my community engagement class this semester, and it's really interesting to see, I teach it about once, once every year and a half, but to see where people are during COVID and when it's so hard to really reach each other, but how desperate we are to feel a sense of connection. I mean, I just yesterday, I had three phone calls that took almost the whole day because people just wanted to talk. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think, you know, this, all of what you're saying is all so important, but, you know, just starting to listen to each other and to hear. And, you know, I can't help but say that in listening to <laughs> the royalties the other night, how much it was their own experience going to other places and listening to people that helped to transform their own thinking about their role in the world and all of our roles. I mean, I'm just so moved yeah. and humbled every time somebody shares an authentic real world experience. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, and after the COVID year, we're all looking for face-to-face -face personal relationships again. Um, I think um, a couple of other things. Um, I am hopeful about the kind of the renewed visibility of workers, working people. Um, I think we have had a lot of rhetoric that's often kind of sentimental about frontline workers and essential workers. But at the same time, there's a, a deepened recognition across the whole society that working people in in often invisible occupations are at the heart of the society. That brings me back to one of my, my beefs about the academic literature on the civil rights movement, which is the centrality of work and working people to the movement is often invisible. Um, but if you look at, for example, Martin Luther King's speeches in the last two years of his life, or the March on Washington, which was the March for Jobs and Freedom, uh, work was really central and his, his great speech should be a text. If I had time to do it, I would have done it. Um, his that all labor has dignity speech in Memphis, 18th March 18th in 1968 before he was killed. Uh, he says every kind of work that lifts up humanity has dignity and it has value. Mm -hmm. And and community colleges are an important place for that consciousness to be mm -hmm. revived and born. Mm -hmm. Gary, there is a question and Valerie has in the chat, sure. and I don't know if Valerie, you want to ask it yourself or I'm happy to read it. 
Yeah, I'll go ahead. Do you think things are different now or just a categorically different type of struggle? Well, things are always changing. <laughs> Um, in the modern technological um, internet world, um, there are new dangers, there are new threats, there are new divisions. Uh, social media has some uses, but it also serves to divide people. Um, but I think um, there are some old, old lessons. Like the foundation of democracy uh, is the work of the people, and we need to remember that. Um, and every person has potential and value. Uh, as I was talking about Jay Tice of Lone Star Community College, having to work with his coaches in public achievement, that they're not doing a service project rescuing these poor uh, Hispanic kids. That's true for all of our work. Um, we find students today come into any kind of public effort, like we had a partnership with Somalis and uh, East Asian and, and uh, Latin Americans immigrants in the Twin Cities for 20 years. And we had several thousand students from area colleges involved in that. We had to do an orientation that they were not doing a service project to help the poor immigrants. They were going to be involved in what we call public work and free spaces and a collaborative effort. They're going to learn as much or, or more than they actually contribute. So I think actually there's some old lessons that really need to be revived, although we're in a new period and the new challenges and new issues. And, and certainly today we have enormous challenges like racial disparities and climate um, uh, violence and polarization. So I think it's both in. I know we are out of time. It is one o'clock, but um, Harry will be staying with us. Dr. Boyd will be staying uh, with us to the second hour. So a lot of these questions I'm seeing now kind of filter in the chat uh, from Henrietta, Melissa, and Wissam. Perhaps we can engage those in our groups um, because we do, we are um, on that one o'clock hour. So Please hold on to those questions. Let's bring them to our group discussions. And we're gonna transition now into our second hour where all of you get to really talk about these great ideas that were shared today.